Hello everybody uh, and good evening and this is Peter Svidler with the uh, highlights video for game 9 of the World J Championship match going on in London between Magnus Carlsen and Fabiano Caruana. Uh, game 9 uh, heralds the uh, beginning of the last third of the match and uh, nerves are going to be playing a larger and larger part I feel and the tension uh, has to be very very uh, hard to manage. Uh, the scores are still equal, uh, were still equal going into the game and uh, um, the big the big question of the day before the game started was as usual what Magnus will choose to do uh, on move one and it seems like uh, sort of it, it feels like a joke but the rotation is still on uh, after 1d4 uh, in the first half of the match the second wide game uh, Magnus had he he played one c4 and then played played one e4, and now we also have uh, one d4 in game seven and one c4 played in game nine, but connected with a different idea. Once again, Fabiano decides not to uh, dodge of what has to be uh, Magnus's uh, serious preparation and plays the exact same line against one c4 he did in game four. Uh, knight of six, knight of three, knight c6, g3, d5, takes takes. Bishop g2 and bishop c5. The move that uh, has been introduced into uh, high-level Grandmaster practice by one of my co-commentators, Grandmaster Alexander Grishuk, and Anish Giri today, live on air, said uh, something that shouldn't really come as very much of a surprise these days, that he knew of the existence of bishop c5 before the, the game uh, against, I believe, Pavel Ilyanov, in which uh, Grishuk uh, pioneered the idea, but uh, as usual it becomes a race of who uh, gets to show this idea first uh, in tournament practice because uh, everybody is basically looking at similar positions and similar ideas will crop up every now and again. Castles, Castles, d3, rook e8 is still uh, following game uh, 4 and here Magnus goes bishop g5 which is uh, not an unknown move but a very rare one and Fabiano was not surprised by that development at all played knight takes c3, bc and f6, to which Magnus replied by uh, bishop c1, which is quite a striking development, obviously. White spends two tempi, basically, to uh, prompt black to take on c3 and to play f7, f6. And uh, neither of those two things are particularly harmful to black, but taking on c3, of course, connects the white structure, opens the potential uh, b file for the, rook, uh, for the use of the white rook and gives white additional options in the center. Uh, Fabiano played bishop e6 quite quickly, and one of those ideas was immediately shown by Magnus. He played bishop b2 here, uh, pushing for immediate d3, d4. A much more natural move, and I think the move you would make in a blitz game here with white <clears throat> is the move knight of 3, d2, because it's very logical to open up the bishop on g2 and maybe play knight e4 or knight b3 later in the game. You also play rook b1 at some point uh, hitting the pawn on b7 and uh, uh, seemingly creating some issues for black. But Magnus's plan is very different, and I have a feeling that perhaps uh, bishop b2 already was a slight surprise for, for Fabi, because here he started thinking, and uh, generally he... Uh, uh, this is the first game uh, in some time, I believe, in this match, where he went very seriously behind on the clock, compared to what Magnus was doing, and I'm pretty sure this is the first game in this match where he got out prepared in one of his black games. And it probably doesn't make very much sense for me to go in depth uh, about this position. I don't really know very much about this position in general, so I can't say I figured very, uh, very many things out properly whilst preparing for this video, and also it might be relevant for future games, so... I will say that black has a number of very decent options here. Uh, some of them we discussed on air. For instance, the move queen e7, which I mentioned on air, appears to be quite playable with the intention of meeting d4 with rook a d8. And uh, since white is pu pushing for d3, d4, which will hit the bishop on c5, evacuating it to some square uh, makes, makes definite sense. And Fabi chose bishop b6. Uh, and the other obvious move in the same spirit, but in a di different direction, bishop f8 here, once again sidestepping the uh, d3, d4 push before it even comes, 
also makes a, a ton of sense. And after g4, black, for instance, can play bishop e6, f7, completely, uh, well, sort of uh, making his position as compact as possible, sidestepping potential ideas of e4, g5 with, uh, with the forks, and also preparing to play knight f5, because now the pawn on e5 is protected. So all of these things are, uh, are reasonably playable and lead to uh, complicated double-edged positions. After the chosen, uh, uh, after bishop b6, which was chosen by Caruana, uh, white played d4. And here, once again, uh, Fabi uh, took a very, very long time to make a decision and uh, went for the move bishop d5, which you probably would argue is the most natural move in the position, stopping the ideas with e2, e4, and also sort of neutralizing the bishop on g2 for the future. But black had uh, other interesting options, in particular, uh, he could play knight a5, after which white probably should play queen c2, because if we take an e5, black can take on g1 first, white has to take with the f rook, because if you take with the a rook, bishop takes a2 is actually quite strong. And after rook fd1, knight c4, bishop c1, and rook a d8, uh, black is just doing quite well. Uh, therefore, after knight a5, white, will, white most likely plays queen c2, and in this position, for instance, something like bishop f7, e3, and c6 leads to very double-edged positions, which I do not believe are necessarily worse for black at all. But uh, it's probably exactly what Magnus wanted out of today's game, because uh, there is a lot of pieces on the board, there is really no way for black to force any kind of immediate simplifications here, and uh, it doesn't really matter that much, I guess, if white is better or not, because... Uh, there's a lot of play ahead, and this is generally what Magnus likes in a game of chess. After bishop d5, Magnus more or less instantly played queen c2. In fact, he only started thinking, I believe, somewhere around move 18 when Fabiano made what I think everybody will agree was a slightly suboptimal choice objectively, although in practical terms you can definitely understand it. And here, uh, Fabi once again took a very, very long time and played uh, e takes d4, which is quite logical, because white obviously already starts very seriously thinking about both uh, e4 and maybe even in some cases c4. But the, the question we couldn't really answer on air until uh, some strong players in chat, in particular a very welcome addition to, to our uh, chat contingent, uh, Anish's second, Erwin Lemmy, uh, pointed out that after e5, e4 here, the move which we could not refute at all during the live show. White has this stunning idea of playing knight h4. And it is stunning because of the following, uh, because of the next two moves. Uh, the move itself is perfectly normal. White is now threatening c4, but uh, after knight a5, where basically during the live show we just stopped talking about the position once we realized knight a5 is a move, because it seems like black assumes total control in the center and we'll have a vice creep on all the light squares. But here, the machine goes knight c5, and if you continue with your normal moves, the computer goes knight e3 here. And it is very, very difficult, I believe, to spot this idea if you don't know it exists. But the point here is that if black takes on e3, after f3, the bishop on g2 appears to be completely dead, and all black needs to do to probably be much better slash winning is to stop c3, c4. But he just cannot stop c3, c4, and then his position basically will probably collapse because the pawn on e4 will become weak, this bishop becomes stronger, the pawn might get all the way to c5, and the bishop on b6 will be in trouble. This is just very, very poor for black. And the machine says after knight f5, you're more or less obliged to play c5, knight e3, and rook c8. In this order, very natural inclusion of cd4, cd4, and rook c8, uh, after queen a4 leads to positions the machine doesn't like at all, but the immediate rook c8, uh, it says, is playable. And now, for instance, after dc5, bishop c5, knight d5, queen takes d5, uh, and d3, uh, black is probably fine, but because of uh, the move f7, f6, which is also a recurring theme, uh, it's a very unpleasant weakening of the kingside structure here, in particular in positions where black was forced to give up his light squared bishop. Uh, he obviously has decent compensation for it in the form of 
the broken up structure of white has on the queen side and the somewhat passive bishop on b2. But the position is quite unclear and white has some hopes of maybe pushing here for a little bit. Uh, the reason we were very curious about e4 is that having discounted knight h4, we were trying to make the most natural move in the position, which is knight d2. <clears throat> and here after e4, e3, black is in fact uh, completely fine. Uh, maybe more than fine even. Uh, Fabi spent a very decent chunk of time on uh, uh, choosing to take on d4. And I have a feeling he very, very seriously considered e4. And the fact that he decided not to play it uh, probably means that he either found the whole knight h4, knight f5, uh, knight e3 idea, or he just felt that uh, against a player who has uh, an hour and 45 minutes on move 14 in this position, making the most strategically risky move is uh, not the best idea in the world. So he took on d4, c takes d4, bishop e4, queen b3, bishop d5, and of course, white does not intend to repeat here and goes queen d1. And uh, at this moment in the live show, we went on a break and we checked uh, briefly the computer evaluation whilst on the break. And it seemed like black was completely fine after something like queen d7. But when preparing for this video, I continued making moves for both sides here. And after something like e3, rook ad8 and bishop c3, to keep an eye on the, on the a5 square, it seems like white is actually quite significantly better because, uh, you know, a, a typical continuation here can be something like king h8. White makes another sort of generally useful move, a strengthening move, rook e1. And black's is black issue here is that the bishop on b6 is quite stupid and knight on c6 is also not doing very much. Uh, but if he, let's say, goes uh, knight a5 here, white has the option of playing, for instance, queen b1. I don't think it's the only move in the position, but it's useful to create squares for the rook on, uh, on e1. And after, uh, let's say, queen c6, also, of course, queen b1 creates an idea of e3, e4, which needs to be addressed somehow. So queen c6 seemingly has a very strong uh, double threat in reply, hitting the uh, knight on f3 and the bishop on c3. And here white uh, does something which is very typical for these structures. He gives up uh, one of the uh, bishops uh, for the knight because that bishop really wasn't doing very much. It was severely restricted by white's own structure. Black takes on a5, rook c1, queen has to go somewhere, and now you go knight h4. And most likely the light square bishops will come off the board, and the knight, which probably via g2 will get to some good squares like f4, or later maybe g3, white is just significantly better here, because once again, the bishop is somewhat misplaced on a5, and also, very, very importantly, the pawn on f6 should not be on f6. It should be on f7. And that weakening of, of the king side will be uh, uh, problematic for black for the uh, remainder of the game. But we still expected Fabi to do something like this, queen d7, or perhaps the immediate knight a5, which can also be met by bishop c3, and white still uh, remains um, somewhat better. Maybe not much better, but definitely somewhat better. Uh, instead of all that, Fabiano spent a very, very long time considering his options and played bishop takes f3, which leads to a position which I'm pretty sure he knew will be quite unpleasant for him, but it also is most likely holdable. Uh, and uh, the reason I say it's a brave decision, <clears throat> my apologies, is that seemingly the type of a position you will get later uh, almost by force after you take on f3, uh, is exactly the type of position that Magnus uh, made a career on, pretty much. A position with uh, zero risk for white and a very, very stable uh, pressure uh, with no counterplay. Uh, white could, of course, start by taking uh, on f3 here, and after knight d4, uh, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, and queen b3 check, we basically get the position we got in the game, but Magnus decided to start with queen b3 check, I guess for style points more than anything else. King h8, bishop takes f3. White could take with the queen here, but there's really no difference uh, in terms of the outcome. Black he still has to take with the knight, because bishop takes d4. Rook a d1 is just very, very bad for black due to the uh, pin on the d-file. So knight takes, we take, 
queen takes e3, let's say queen e5, queen takes b7, and rook a d8. And we got a very similar position later in the game, but the queen uh, in the game was on b3 and not on b7, and I think it just does better on b3. So I quite like Magnus's decision to take with the bishop. Knight d4 is strictly the only move. Bishop takes, queen takes. As usual, you cannot take with the bishop because after rook ad1 there is no real defense against e2, e3. So queen takes. <clears throat> White could start by taking on b7, but it would have led to the same positions anyway. Magnus goes e3. It is very important to restrict the bishop on b6 here. It really isn't doing very much there apart from uh, cementing this uh, weird uh, structure. And after e3, uh, black could try uh, playing for some tactics, for instance by queen d6. Bishop takes b7 and rook b8, hoping that the bishop goes somewhere, and then you have the bishop takes e3, uh, uh, intermediary move. But here white can start by rook ag1, but, but an even cuter way to sidestep all these tactics is to play queen a4, attacking the rook on a8 and making sure that black cannot pick up the bishop on b7, and also sidestepping all the potential x-rays along the b-file. Understanding all that, uh, Fabiano takes a very wise decision to not even pretend he has any tactics here. Goes queen e5, bishop takes b7, and rook, G, rook a d8. And we enter the uh, second phase of the game, which we expected to be quite lengthy, but which in actual fact lasted for two and a half moves. Uh, the material is equal, and uh, there's only one open file uh, on the board, which will obviously be heavily contested and in many cases will lead to all the rooks being swapped down on the g-file. Black has no real uh, pawn weaknesses because his uh, somewhat disjointed pawns on a7 and c7 are very well connected by the bishop on b6. Despite all that, white is we felt during the game, white is quite significantly better. And white is definitely quite significantly better in terms of practical play, even if objectively black should not lose this position if he defends precisely and patiently. And the reason for that is the, the, the difference in the quality of bishops and in king safety. Because the king, either on g1 or on g2, will be completely safe with the light square bishop somewhere on the uh, f3 square, for instance, whereas the black king uh, because, once again, he played f6, will always be uh, under a certain cloud here, and black will have to uh, be very, very careful about not allowing white to open any files around the king. And one obvious plan white has in this position is to try and push the pawn from h2 all the way up to h5, in particular if he can manage to do that before black played g6 and king g7, because then it becomes very difficult for black to solve his uh, king issues without creating additional targets. Magnus starts by playing rook ad1, and already here we were slightly curious why uh, Fabiano started with queen e7 and not g6, because g6 looks very natural and the queen has a very good perch on e5. But here, queen f7, which uh, we sort of dismissed during the live show because of rook f8 and the queen has to go back, is actually quite unpleasant for black. If black does go rook f8, we can take take and play rook c1, creating a somewhat unpleasant idea of eventually landing this rook on c6. And in general, it is just difficult for black to move, because the move he would like to make, bishop c5, with the ideas of queen e7 later, just runs into rook takes c5, and white is uh, uh, doing very, very well. Uh, and here, somewhat to my surprise, the machine actually suggests uh, playing queen d6, rook c6, queen f8, just giving up the f-pawn and then winning the a-pawn in reply by attacking the pawn on a2 and the pawn on e3. But some position like this after king f3, rook a2 and g4 could very easily become very, very dangerous for black once again because of how uh, unkempt and, and unprotected his king is here. Let's say if white manages to play g5 and bishop d5, there will be an immediate mating net on the king's side. And another position black could go for here after queen f7 is, let's say, uh, rook takes d1, rook takes d1, and queen e6. But here white goes rook d7, takes, takes, f5, and h4. And once again, I would not want to be playing this position with black against Magnus Carlsen. Uh, 
I think uh, it is very, very plausible to actually lose this despite equal material and no immediate threats. So I think stopping queen f7 is a very decent idea here for Fabi. Queen e7, h4, g6. And this is an important turning point in the game because Magnus made what really is the most obvious move in the position. And it pretty much led to a forced draw. But I think the reason Magnus played immediate h5 here and not, for instance, uh, king g2, or arguably what is even more precise, you can you can play bishop c6 first. We were, we were very surprised he did not play bishop c6 first, because if black takes on d1, rook d1 and rook d8, the position after takes takes on queen f7 actually is quite significantly unpleasant. Uh, black needs to uh, drive this queen away, he can play bishop c5, but after bishop d5, he has a rather unfortunate choice of either playing queen f8, queen c7, and queen e7. And I would argue that in practical, in practical play, this is probably lost for black, because uh, he will be able to play king g7 next and get the king out, but he is now a healthy pawn down, and white will always have some threats against the king you have to watch out for on every move, because of uh, how strong the light-squared bishop, which will be somewhere on the b3 square, is. Sometimes you make a draw in these positions, but in general, you expect to uh, suffer for another 50 moves, eventually blunder something and lose. And the other option after bishop d5 would be to play bishop d6, h5, and queen f8. But not being the world's biggest authority on the opposite color bishop endings, I am not prepared to sort of testify this as a draw, although it probably is. Black plays king g7 and pretends this is a fortress, but as mentioned, I am not 100% convinced it is. So starting by bishop c6 would have given black uh, an option of going for all that or playing rook f8. And then we've, we've, I believe we've sort of improved here with white because the bishop is slightly better on c6 than it is on b7. And we uh, managed to uh, force the rook from e8 to f8, where it arguably stands slightly worse. But it's not a large difference. And of course, an important move here would be something like king g2. And I have a feeling Magnus decided not to do that and start with h5, because this gives black the one tempo he needs to play h5. And now we can play something like bishop c6, rook f8, queen b1, king g7, bishop e4, force black to play f5 and play bishop f3. And this is not a draw, but once again the feeling is black probably doesn't lose this position if he defends carefully. But this still would have been pretty much exactly what Magnus probably wanted out of today's game, because there's really no way for black to equalize. Uh, he will have to defend a position which will remain worse and worse and worse. It's just probably impossible for white to make inroads. And I don't think white wins this uh, very, let's say, I don't think white wins very many games out of 10 here between two equal players. But... It's still a very pleasant position to play because you can try all kinds of things and maybe hope for for black to make a misstep somewhere. But uh, by playing h5, Magnus was hoping that uh, black will just play king g7, he will play king g2, and by doing this he will sidestep this option of h7, h5, and then black probably has to take on d1, rook takes d1, rook d8, and you can try playing rook h1 here, hoping for a, like, a h5, h6 check which black probably has to uh, uh, allow. So the most natural move in the position is rook d2, once again creating counterplay against the e3 pawn. White goes h6 check, king f8, and rook e1. And to my surprise, this position is actually, according to the machine, very, very dangerous for, uh, for black, uh, because uh, the pawn on h6 is extremely annoying, much more annoying than I originally anticipated. And the machine suggests that more or less only moves you can make here with black are queen c5, creating the idea of queen c2, white goes rook d1, and in this position, once again, somewhat surprisingly to my eyes, machine insists you have to play c7, c6, creating the threat of queen d5 check, uh, hoping to uh, liquidate uh, into a pawn down opposite color bishop endgame, which black probably should hold. And this position uh, appears to be closer to a draw than it is to a white win, but it's clearly very, very playable. And by playing h5, I assume Magnus was hoping to get something like that. 
But Fabi uh, realized this move gives him an additional option. And despite being not very short on time, but definitely a, a serious way behind Magnus on the clock, he still uh, found the, the, the courage, so to speak, to play GH5 here. And this move more or less makes a draw uh, in practical terms, because it turns out that there is really no good way for white to stop h5, h4. And once again, the assumption has to be that Magnus uh, saw g h5 and thought, I will play queen c4, stopping h4 for the time being, creating the threat of bishop f3, for instance, or even maybe king g2, rook h1. And black has no real way um, to prevent me from picking the pawn up on h5 while it's still on h5. But black has the move f6, f5 here, and this is what happened in the game. And now stopping h4 really becomes un uh, impossible. And white will eventually have to meet h4 with either g3, g4, or taking on h4 and uh, uh, once again re-establishing the previous pawn structure. But uh, with uh, the g-pawn traded off the board, which uh, gives black a ton of uh, counterplay which wasn't uh, there in the position until all that happened. And considering the position Magnus eventually went for, you could make an argument that instead of queen c4, it was better to play rook, bishop c6, rook g8, we take on d8, and we play rook d1 here. Black plays h4, and we take on h4. I'm not making an argument this is better for white, but it would have required some precision from black. Uh, something like, let's say, bishop c5, we play king f1, black takes, takes, plays queen d6, queen f3, and let's say, just for uh, to discuss this type of position, if white is in time to play bishop e4 and queen f5 here, I'm not sure he wins, but he definitely comes close, I think. But black has the immediate f6, f5 here, and he holds, because he will either bring the king over to f6, or just play queen f6 and bishop d6, and this will be a safe enough position. Uh, but Magnus did play queen c4, f5, bishop f3, h4, and he went very deep into the tank here, uh, and eventually made a move we did not expect. He took on d8, abandoning the d-file, uh, but still continuing to play. And we thought that if he wanted to continue playing for a win here, he absolutely has to play uh, g3, g4. And as a matter of fact, um, the machine doesn't really show any direct ways for black to make a draw here, but it also doesn't think that black is worse. And for instance, it plays queen g7, king h1, fg4, and here it argues that white has to take on d8 first, takes with the rook, bishop takes g4, and here black has a reasonably comfortable draw by playing rook g8, rook g1, and now simply h5, queen d5, h takes g4, queen h5, and this is a perpetual. And the machine says that if white tries to avoid the perpetual by playing something like bishop h3 or Bishop f3, white is simply not better after something like queen f6, which I can definitely believe in because uh, black has an extra pawn. It's not a very healthy extra pawn. It's doubled on the h file, but the king on h1 is also not particularly safe. Black in many cases will be trying to bring the bishop from b6 to d6, where it will start creating actual threats against the white king side. But if Magnus wanted something unbalanced with uh, potential winning chances, if, let's say, the queens come off the board here in a good addition for white, and then he can bring the king over to h3, and maybe in some, you know, feverish dreams to start pushing the e and f pawns forward. But quite clearly, it's unlikely to happen. Black has no real reason to allow any of that. Magnus's choice was to take on d8, rook takes d8 and gh, but black is just exceedingly comfortable here. He, sh he can make a draw in, in any number of ways. Rook g8 check is a good start, making sure that the king goes to h1 and not, let's say, to f1 once the rook leaves the f1 square. And here, many moves uh, equalize. Fabi played queen f6, which is perfectly serviceable. But in terms of sort of forcing the draw, queen e5 probably was even more precise, because you want to play f5, f4 against more or less anything. Uh, let's say if white goes h5, you play f4, white takes, you take, take, you play rook f8, black is not even remotely worse in this position. And if white goes rook g1, which is something he has done in the game as well, you can take, take, and play f4, and obviously if white takes on f4, 
this position is just a dead, dead draw. And if he plays e4, black can start attacking the pawn on f2, and uh, there is just no problem for black to, to hold this position whatsoever. But as mentioned, the move queen f6 that Fabi chose is not really bad at all. The same thread is established, so Magnus played queen f4, bishop c5, rook g1, takes, takes, bishop d6. And in an endgame like this, where it is opposite color bishops, uh, equal material, and reasonably symmetrical structure, it's quite clear that it should end in a draw. Although Magnus continued playing for a while, he played queen a4. Fabi played f4, which the machine initially dislikes and then realizes it's a very, very good move. Queen a7 check, takes, takes, and queen takes h4. This required some uh, reasonably precise calculation, but it's not very difficult to understand that after queen c3 check, king g8, check, king f8, check, king e7, check, king d8, white has all kinds of perpetual, but no mate, because once some kind of a mating threat is established, black will always have uh, at least a perpetual uh, with all the queen checks that are available to him. For instance, check, check, bishop c6, black plays king, uh, queen g5, and white actually has to play bishop g2 to uh, sidestep to sidestep the threat of queen c1 check, picking the bishop up. After queen h4, Magnus played a2, a4, uh, which actually this pawn could have been picked up, but I, I, I can understand why Fabi, who was running somewhat short on time here, decided not to check if this position is still no more than a perpetual. But we couldn't find any mate during the live show, and the computer does confirm that uh, there is nothing here for white. He can pick up the h-pawn, but after queen h7, both, uh, let's say, king d8 and king f6, queen f7, king g5 are very, very safe uh, draws for black. But Fabi, instead of all that, played queen f6. Uh, now if you play a5, black will give a check, king g2, and take on a5, and queen c3 check is no longer available, and after queen d4, black can play queen e5. So Magnus played bishop d1, queen e5, took on e5, and continued playing uh, this position for a while, but uh, we were discussing on air just how much uh, black needs to abandon here to lose. And the answer is, Probably if you give up the pawn on h7 and white establishes some kind of a setup with the bishop on c2 and the pawn on f5, that position might at some point become lost, or perhaps already is lost, but I think it still very much depends on where the kings are. But because black still has both of his pawns and uh, it's very unlikely he will lose them, there's really no risk of him losing because after, let's say, a5, bishop, king g7, a6, bishop g4, very soon you will have the setup that happened in the game. King g2, king f6, f4, bishop b6, king f3, h6, king e4, bishop a7. And here it's very easy to understand that if you run with the king towards the bishop, let's say king d5, bishop b6, king c6, bishop b3, uh, king b7, bishop b6, a7. Well, obviously you have to play bishop g4 at some point, and this is what Magnus did. Yeah, let's, let's go bishop g4. Uh, uh, bishop g1, king d5, bishop b6, king c6, bishop b3. This actually happened in the game. King b7, bishop b6. And here, if you pick up the, the, the bishop, black makes the most trivial draw in the, in the world by just pushing the c-pawn forward. And once the bishop is distracted, you, you can pick up the, the f4-pawn with ease. Uh, realizing all that, Magnus played bishop h3 and then ran with the king back and repositioned his king... Uh, to e4. But the issue for him here is that in this position, if black now allows, let's say, let's make a couple of passing moves. If black allows this, he probably will at some point be forced to start pushing the h-pawn because I we believe, at least this is what it looked like to us during the live show, that if you make one more passing move in this position, a7 actually wins or at least it wins with the bishop on e4, because the push of the pawns is no longer fast enough, and the, queen, the, the king from a7 is in time to return uh, and protect the pawn on e4. But obviously black can start pushing his own pawns, and it should be a draw. But an even simpler draw was uh, shown by Caruana. He played king e6, bishop c4 check, king f6, bishop d3, and just went back to e6, uh, saying to Carlsen, I'm not even going to allow king d5, king c6, and if you give a check from c4, as he has done, 
you cannot really play king d5 because king f5 picks up this pawn immediately. And uh, at this point, uh, uh, the players agreed to a draw. Uh, unsurprisingly, because really all the uh, resources have been uh, by this point completely exhausted. With this draw, uh, the match obviously is still uh, completely level, four and a half against four and a half. Uh, Fabi has three wide games in, in the sorry two wide games in the remaining three games uh, of the match, which gives him obviously a slight uh, a slight advantage. And the last two games are sort of bucking the the trend of the the match so far because White is finally getting something out of uh, out of the games in particular. In game eight, Fabiano came very, very close to winning uh, in the uh, 95 uh, Sveshnikov that uh, the players discussed. Uh, so make sure to tune in tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. Central European to our coverage of game 10. There are only three games remaining. Uh, the pressure is uh, sky high by this point, and we expect uh, a very, very interesting fight in every single game from this moment onwards. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. This has been Peter Swidler with Chess for Chess24 with the recap of Game 9 from London. Thanks for watching.